At this time, I would like to introduce you to our speaker today, Miss Tammy Crotto. Miss Tammy Crotto, we are honored that you are here with us today, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Jesse, and welcome everyone. Um, I'd like to introduce a few of uh, my teammates in this venture with me today. Um, our SEEDS program manager, Elizabeth Pravat, will be here to monitor the chat and get all your questions answered. And our branch chief, Simone Conforto, may also be out there for you. Um, they'll take some turns monitoring the chat, so please feel free at any time to um, add in your questions or comments as they arise. And like Jesse said, we'll do our best to respond to everything, whether it's individually or to the group or even in a follow-up message later today. I'll be referencing your participant guide throughout the session. This was emailed out earlier today to those who are registered and all of our resources will also be available on our SEED SharePoint site by tomorrow. But don't worry about having to reference the guide during the class. Everything you'll need to see right now is gonna be on screen for you. I'm really excited because we're gonna take a slightly different approach to SEEDs today by bringing in a panel of VBA leaders to help us in our discussion. I'll introduce those people to you in just a minute. Um, they're going to share their real world experience to tie in the concepts we're talking about to our work and share how they've learned to balance these skills to provide the type of leadership that their employees need when they need it most. Today's session is based on the book, The Eight Paradoxes of Great Leadership, but you can maybe see a little bit there, um, by Tim Elmore. So whether you're leading formally or informally, or maybe not even quite aware yet of the influence that you have just by being an outstanding team member and inspiring and motivating the people you work with. Um, learning how and when to demonstrate the traits we're gonna talk about today will help you to stand out and have a positive impact in what you do. If there's one recurring theme to becoming a great leader, it's strengthening your emotional intelligence. Leading is all about building relationships, understanding people's needs, and managing your own emotions and behaviors to continually strengthen those relationships. Whether I'm presenting for SEEDS or SMT or AMT or developing curriculum for one of our other leadership programs, I really love to find research and writing that helps me not only to explain the why, but the how to do this. And this book, along with our panelists and their experience, will give us both the why and the how. So after today's training, you'll be able to define the eight paradoxes of great leadership. You'll assess your own areas of strength and challenge in demonstrating these traits, and you'll identify some opportunities for growth and development in your challenge areas. I'll give you a brief overview of the eight paradoxes, and then we'll hear from our panel with their own experiences and examples to illustrate each of them further. Next, you'll spend some time assessing how comfortable you are with demonstrating each of the traits, and then you'll come up with some next steps for yourself to help you grow in the areas that may be challenging for you now. Finally, we'll give you some more time at the end to interact with our panelists and ask them even more questions in the chat. And now I would like to introduce our panelists. And if they could, they're already on camera for us, so they might wanna give a brief hello. Mr. Stephen Cogburn is up first. He is the chief of the VBA Professional Development Academy in Baltimore, which is part of our learning and development division. Welcome, Mr. Cogburn. Yeah, thank you. Uh, happy to be here. Uh, I'm excited about this panel, and I know I've probably had a chance to see some of you coming through SMT or AMT here at the Academy. So looking forward to this and partnering with Ms. Crotto uh, on, on this, uh, uh, on this subject today. Thank you. Next up is Ms. Tanisha Macklin. She's the Chief of the Diversity and Inclusion Team in the Work-Life Wellness Employee Engagement Office, and she is coming to us from Seattle. Good morning to my West Coast family and good afternoon to my East Coast family. Um, as Ms. Crito said, I am here to just add my two cents and continue to grow in my leadership journey as well. So thank you for having me. Thank you. And finally, we have Mr. Tim Stevenson, Assistant Veteran Service Center Manager from the San Juan Regional Office, coming to us from Puerto Rico. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so excited and honored to be here just to share a little bit of my experience uh, since I've been with the organization, and I'm really looking forward to the discussion and the questions. Thank you all so much for joining us today, and we really look forward to hearing your perspectives and learning from your experiences. But let's start with everyone else first. Take a second, if you will, to think about a leader you've worked with who has motivated or inspired you, someone that you consider to be a great leader. In the chat, take the next few seconds to type some of the traits that that person demonstrated that really impressed you or set them apart from others. Find and caring. 
authentic. I see some good ones coming in. Confidence, empathy, respect, fairness, punctual, honesty, trusting, straightforward. These are all great. Fair, firm, consistent. Keep them coming. You may start to notice that some of the traits you see in the window um, may contradict each other a little bit. And that's because research shows that today's employees need well-balanced leaders able to exhibit several qualities or behaviors that seem to exist at opposite ends of a spectrum. Great leaders recognize that not everyone needs the same thing from them at the same time, and that different situations call for different skills. Let's see how Tim Elmore described this. Our work world is constantly changing, and it's changing fast. Employees and supervisors alike face so many challenges, whether it's workload, performance measures to meet, time for professional development, dealing with staffing changes, finding work-life balance, it can be completely overwhelming. And it's no surprise that what we need from our leaders changes just as constantly as everything else in our environment. The US Army War College uses the acronym VUCA to describe our times, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. Now, it's easy to want to escape situations like that, but because we're here and we've chosen to stay, we have to be adaptable to let these kinds of situations draw out our gifts, and leaders have to be able to help others bring out the best in themselves as well. And that takes more than just intelligence and technical skills. Leaders need to be self-aware and know how to put that awareness to use. They need to manage their own emotions, behaviors, and reactions to strengthen relationships, meet the needs and live up to the high expectations of a highly educated, experienced, diverse and talented workforce that is seeing more than its fair share of anxiety and stress. Being able to read and respond to the needs of others, both the ones we're leading and the ones leading us, in addition to meeting organizational goals, sometimes creates a paradox in itself. Through his research with successful corporate leaders, Tim Elmore defined some of the more common paradoxes. We need leaders who are confident, yet humble, who share their vision and are aware of their blind spots, who can be both visible and invisible effectively, who are both stubborn yet open-minded, who can be both deeply personal and inherently collective, who are both teachers and learners, who can demonstrate both high standards and gracious forgiveness, and who are both timely and timeless. That's a lot of challenges for a leader today. Let's briefly take a look at the roles associated with each of these paradoxes. First up, confidence and humility. Because our work reality changes so quickly, leaders need to set aside their pride and maintain a learning mindset. At the same time, employees need to be able to have confidence in their leaders. Disney executive Bob Iger said, there's nothing less confidence inspiring than a person faking knowledge they don't possess. True authority and true leadership come from knowing who you are and not pretending to be anything else. Demonstrating a strength of conviction about what you do know and being strong enough to admit what you don't know or when you're wrong, that's the delicate balance between confidence and humility. There's another strength in being aware of what you know and what you don't know. Being able to effectively communicate vision gives leaders and teams a clear target and a sense of direction, but it's their blind spots those things that they may not know that they don't know, that can sometimes enable them to look for different ways to achieve their goals. Sometimes the things you don't know can make you willing to take a risk that someone else might not take because of their past experience. This quote from Sarah Blakely, the creator and CEO of the company Spanx, sums it up. Don't be intimidated by what you don't know. That can be your greatest strength and ensure that you do things differently from everyone else. Visibility and invisibility. Dr. Martin Luther King was a great leader who modeled his ability to leverage visibility and invisibility. There were times at the beginning of his work when he knew people needed a visible leader to motivate them. They needed to see him modeling the way. Later, he used his invisibility to give others a chance to grow and lead as well. He understood the power of his influence, both through his actions and his absence. Great leaders know when to be seen, and when to step back and trust others to demonstrate their own influence and skills. Stubbornness and open-mindedness. Leaders need to be able to hold stubbornly to their values and goals while remaining adaptable to new ideas, insights, or process improvements. 
This involves checking their ego, yet still being decisive and firm, and always keeping organizational goals and their people at the forefront of their decisions. Strong leaders earn the right to be followed by how responsive they are to the input of their team. This doesn't mean they give in to every dissenting opinion, but they know how to make people feel heard and provide enough big picture insight to bring everyone together to buy into those decisions. Understanding their why, as Simon Sinek says, is a big help in finding this balance. Mr. Cogburn is the first leader who came to my mind when I read about this paradox. Um, Mr. Cogburn, would you like to tell us a little bit about your experience with stubbornness and open-mindedness? Yeah, thank you, ma'am. I appreciate that. So uh, it is something that um, stubbornness or, you know, challenging the process, there's a lot of ways to, to define this and open-mindedness. It's something that um, I have had the ability and fortunate, uh, it's been successful for me. So when you're looking at when you're looking at stubbornness, you think about obstacles and vision and having conviction. So you see that on the slide there. And then open mindedness, it's ability to be able to uh, do things out of the box, look for those opportunities um, and do small things really well. And one of the things for me is when you're looking at being stubborn versus being open minded, uh, being stubborn, I think some people view that as a bad trait because it's been probably told to us by our parents or family members or whoever that you, you, you were, right, were raised by. Um, but when you're being a leader and you're trying to drive the vision of your organization or your executive leadership team, you have to be somebody that's not afraid to make a decision and somebody that's not afraid to um, push back when you, get the, when you get the word no. And I'll share a story, a recent story, um, where I've been a little bit stubborn um that has allowed me to to get some things done um at the professional development academy we have a 20,000 square feet of space and one of the things we're looking to do is change the footprint of the academy so i have two classrooms that can hold about 75 people in it i have a wall that runs down the classrooms the middle section and we've been wanting to change that to a retractable wall to be able to change the footprint and to be able to host larger scale events at the academy um, I put in a request a while back to get that approved and working with OFM and OMS and all of our budget people was able to get that approved. Um, and during the awarding of the contract, we determined that the materials that we're going to use were back ordered by upwards of close to a year and that we needed to look at different alternatives for the wall. And the different alternatives were going to cost an extra almost $250,000. Um, so I, I reached out to my contact and the Office of Mission Support and said, hey, I need $250,000 more, but this is why. And this is a real real story. And they said, no, we cannot give you that. I said, okay, well, you know, it's something we want to do. I think it's very important for the facility. I have no problem going back through and getting it approved again, but I think that if we could just get a word approval today, it's going to allow us to move ahead. And they said, well, we just redid the conference room down at 1800 G Street in D.C., for um, the undersecretary's conference room, which is the main conference room at 1800G, and it didn't cost that much money. And my response, and it was very polite, my response was, you know, I, I'm not keyed in to what y'all are doing down there, but the way we are doing things at the academy is a bit different now. And we're trying to change the face of what this place is and what it means for learning. Um, and that was me being stubborn and, uh, had a chance to meet with this individual uh, on Friday. He was at the academy here with me, and we walked through. And I was able to um, get him to see what my vision was because I was stubborn and I kept at it. And, and we actually were able to get the approval to go ahead and move forward with the project. Um, and that's something that meant a lot to me because it's going to change what we can do here. Uh, so it's about being stubborn can open up some opportunities for you. And being open-minded means you're not going to miss those opportunities. So these two, two things do contradict each other, but they also can tie in really well. Um, and it's about taking, taking that decision, looking at what your vision is, having an open mind about it, but also put your foot in the sand sometimes. Now, not all the time, but know when to pick those battles. And if it's something that's important, Take no is a first answer. Take no is a starting point. How can I get them to yes? Thank you so much, Mr. Cogburn. That's one of my favorite stories uh, that I regularly ask him to share uh, in our SMT sessions as well. I think we can learn a lot from that stubbornness demonstration. 
along with the open mindedness. All right, our next paradox. There we go. People expect more of their leaders in hard times. That means being a voice or a representative of the whole team while still demonstrating empathy for each member and being responsive to the needs of the many as well as the varying needs of the individuals on the team. We need leaders who see and understand our struggles and can personalize the big picture vision so that we can see our part in it and find the value and motivation in that, though we all might relate best to different elements of that picture. Great leaders understand that while we all may be in the same boat, we're not all going through the same storms at the same time. One of my mentors, who was also a former Army officer, once told me, mission first, people always. And GC really lived that motto. It was evident in the way that he took the time to listen to anything that anyone in our region wanted to talk about. And there were over 600 of us. Um, and he was equally intrigued whether those conversations were with fellow SESers or brand new GS5s or with business related topics or the latest news in college football. He always brought us together, but still recognized the things that made us individuals. And I greatly appreciated that from a mentor. Uh, I know that Ms. Macklin and Mr. Stevenson both have some great experience with this particular paradox. So Ms. Macklin, what would you like to share with us here? Um, so for myself, uh, I think that this is a place where, you know, you can truly shine as a person. Um, even though you're a leader, you're you're setting that example um, on a personal level. Uh, I always look at leadership as a privilege. You know, um, it's not a right. It's something that I, you know, someone looked into me, looked at me and said, I think that you have that capability. I think you have those skills. And so for me, I want to be able to pass that same thought process uh, to my team and and who I'm whomever I'm in charge of. Um, so I take the time to like connect with my team, uh, find out their whys and their purpose. And then, you know, through hard times, you know, because again, we are all we all work for the VA, right? So we're all used to that change, that pivot, being very flexible. Um, you know, we we face those difficult times. We face that time of being, you know, tired and stressed or feeling burnt out. And during those times, I try to remind my team of their why and their purpose. And then also, even in times of success, you know, I apply their whys to that checkpoint. You know, I'm I'm letting them know, like, hey, remember we had that conversation about you wanting to get this, you know, to to navigate this to your professional journey. And look at what you're doing. Look how you're, you know, doing these things and succeeding. Um, so I think having those moments, not even just in the hard times, but also even the good times really helps enhance your leadership skill um, and also motivates your team to want to keep doing the, the mission and keep pushing forward towards the why. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Mr. Stevenson, would you like to elaborate on your own experiences with this paradox? Absolutely. One of the things that first came to mind um, was I'll give a story uh, through my experience with the VA. Um, I was a brand new assistant coach and I was shadowing a seasoned um, coach who had been with the office uh, for quite some time. And one of the things that I remember, um, I sat in with her for um, her monthly meetings when she was meeting with the employees. And the thing, two things impressed me um, just to this day that I still remember very, very well is that as she was speaking to each individual employee, she would talk about their performance, which was the, the whole point of the meeting, but she would also then pivot and speak about some very personal things um, in each of the employees' lives. And it wasn't as if she was just saying, oh, hey, how's things outside of work? But she, and I'm being a little facetious, but you'll understand my point. She would say, oh, how's your neighbor's dog's cousin's best friend? Um, I remember they had the surgery and and she knew all of this information about her employees. And, and the second thing that really stood out in my mind was that when it came time for the hard conversations, her employees knew <clears throat> that it wasn't, her focus wasn't just on the mission. And so the, the takeaways that I took from that had to do with her being very personal, deeply personal with the employees, but also she could maintain focus in what the mission of the team was, what the mission of the agency was, and that connection between the two paradoxes, I think, made her a far more effective leader. So that's that's my one example of, of how I think those two paradoxes really work hand in hand. 
Thank you so much. That really illustrates the, the mission first people always motto that my mentor shared with me as well. Elizabeth, before we move on, is there anything in the chat that we'd like to bring up or, or catch up on? No specific questions, just a lot of great contributions and some quotes that people are adding um, that really are on point with a lot of these themes. Um, someone uh, reiterated the importance of taking your blinders off to see the bigger picture and knowing that your talents are recognized and utilized is very energizing for employees. Excellent. Thank you. All right, a few more paradoxes to go. Teaching and learning. This next paradox also relates back to our ability to demonstrate confidence and humility. So you may see some connectivity between some of the paradoxes as well. Dr. Temple Grandin is a professor of animal science at Colorado State University, and she's famous for a groundbreaking approach to decoding animal behavior through over 50 years of research and observation. She is also neurodivergent and a strong advocate for people like herself who've been diagnosed with autism. She's been a lifelong learner and teacher, and she had to define her own thought processes and needs and then share them with others to try to improve education for children on the autism spectrum. She continues to learn and to teach, not for power or money, but to make a positive contribution. This resonated really deeply with me, and it adds to my respect for leaders who continue to learn as much as they teach. I know Mr. Cogburn is currently the leader of our Professional Development Academy, but he's also a student in our ADDP cohort. So maybe he can tell us a little bit about how he balances uh, both of those paradoxes. Yeah, thank you, man. I, I appreciate that. So yeah, as Ms. Carter said, uh, I, while I have oversight of supervisor management training and advanced management training, I'm also uh, in the assistant director development program cohort this year with nine other individuals. So balancing that, I'll give you a great example of, of being a teacher versus a learner. Um, uh, the week of uh, ADDB Foundations Week was also the same week we had SMT, and uh, we had some things come up where uh, we had the presenters that weren't able to be here. So the Monday, as we were setting up for ADDP, I taught a couple classes that day um, in in SMT because it was I was trying to support my own program because it just made more sense for me to do it. I was already here. Um, and the very next day I pivot to being that learner. And that's something that I'm going to think about for a long time because that was an opportunity for me to give back with some of the stuff that I knew, but then turn right back around the very next day and sit in a classroom and learn from people that are, are you know, in different leadership positions uh, above me. So I was able to go and pivot within that 24 hour period from teacher to learner. And I think you have to have the ability to go back and forth because if you, if you don't, then you're going to end up hurting yourself and your team that are around you. And I don't want anybody to think leaving out of here that you have to be a formal quote unquote leader to do these things. Every one of you is a leader because you're taking the time out of your day to come into a training like this to learn about different concepts and principles so that wherever you're at in your journey will help you, whether you are somebody that's in the team or you're a formal leader, having the ability to bounce back and forth between identifying the needs you need and the gaps in your own learning, but then be able to turn around and give that back, whether it's in a mentorship or in a formal facilitator role. Um, that's one of those things that I think is in, in, incredibly valuable now, especially with uh, the increased number of folks we've hired in the past couple of years. Thank you so much. Definitely motivates me. We've mentioned strength a few times in discussing these paradoxes, and sometimes that strength itself can feel like a paradox, whether it relates to demonstrating humility or, in this case, forgiveness. Mahatma Gandhi said, the weak can never forgive. Forgiveness is an attribute of the strong. It's not just setting high standards that makes leaders great. It's being able to graciously forgive when those standards may not be met. The balance of these traits also adds psychological safety to your work environment. People will achieve more when they feel safe to take risks, when they know their leader will have their backs if they should fall short. They'll also have the clarity and direction they need to strive for excellence when those high standards are not only communicated clearly, but also visibly practiced by their leader. Okay, if you've worked with me before or been to any of my classes, you know that I am a parrot head at heart. Part of the magic of Jimmy Buffett was his ability to not only create music that was relevant and authentic to his multitudes of fans, but to build an entire brand around the feeling that his music provided. 
a brand that added up to over a billion dollar empire at the time of his death last year. And since then, his music and style have been picked up and carried on by countless other artists from the Zac Brown band to Pitbull. He remained aware of changing times. During the pandemic, Jimmy Buffett was in his 70s, but he created a huge online following by telling the stories behind some of his most famous songs and even some of the lesser known ones in a regular social media broadcast. He also stayed relevant for his followers. He created restaurants, resorts, even a cruise line to help people escape to Margaritaville when they needed it most. He balanced being timely with being timeless. Now it's time to hear more from our panel of great VBA leaders. So feel free at this time to type any of your questions for them into the chat, whether it's directed to a particular panelist or for the whole group. If we can't get to all of your questions now, we'll also have some time for additional Q&A after our action planning segment. Let's jump right in. Uh, a few of you have already done this for me, but let's uh, see if we can describe a situation in which you or a leader you worked with had to demonstrate uh, the balance of some of our paradoxes. What challenges did they face or did you face? What was the outcome? And what, if anything, would you have done differently? We'll start with Ms. Macklin. Um, well, I will give an example of, I. this isn't a leader I worked with, I wish I had, but somebody I admire, um, First Lady, former First Lady Michelle Obama, um, what I thought about the paradox of her visibility and invisibility, right? Um, with the field that I work in, the purpose of what I do is to give people the knowledge and purpose of DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And the lasting invisibility of that is to leave them wanting more, to leave them to actually enhance their own experience and learning more about the purpose of DEI and how it benefits the workforce and your own personal life. And what I liked about Michelle Obama was um, the fact that when she was campaigning for her programs, um, when she was in the White House, uh, she was able to be the front for, at the forefront of everything and champion these pro programs and, you know, facing adversity as a pushback because people didn't necessar necessarily buy into her, um, what she actually was trying to uplift. Um, but through her actions and through continuous dedication and showing that she was able to push through those adversities, um, she actually became a forefront and catalyst of that program. But after she left, you know, her programs still are ran and still are part of um, our, our Department of Education. Um, they're still empowering people to advance in further education as well as um, just being able to exemplify, you know, what she has given in her own poise and grace. And so anytime that I have to uh, give a program or a proposal regarding diversity, equity, inclusion, I think of her saying, uh, when we when they go low, we go high, because it is a program that uh, isn't always accepted, isn't always uh, understood. And a lot of times it's not understood because people don't know the actual how how um, how broad that DEI is. And so when it comes to being able to combat some of those uncomfortable conversations or the um, the unwelcoming of it, um, I think of that as a pillar to help me continue to be that visible leader. And then when I leave that discussion to keep le keep being that invisible leader that leaves them with the knowledge base and, and get fighting them with wanting more so that they know that they can proceed more, giving them resources and uh, progression in, within this field and, and just my training and my my um, tutelage. So I would say that is uh, what I, one of my paradoxes and what I admire. Um, again, like I said, I wish I could work with Miss uh, Obama if anybody knows her and wants to <laughs> throw my name into the hat, please do. But um, yeah, that she's somebody I admire and look at quite frequently. Thank you so much. And one of the the quotes that she uh, had in her book, Becoming, was about um, understanding the power of your voice and being able to tell your authentic story. And that really touched me a lot when I read that one. Fantastic example. Thank you. Mr. Stevenson, same question to you. Uh, so describing the situation um, of the paradoxes, I would say one that, um, again, sticks out of my mind is being a teacher 
and a learner. Um, for that particular one, uh, it stood out in my mind just because uh, in our roles as leaders, sometimes we are placed in new situations, uh, in new environments, and the expectation is that we bring some degree of leadership, direction, vision, all of those things that we would reasonably expect uh, would come with being in a leadership role. And the challenge may be is that sometimes um, when we don't know what to ask, or maybe even if we're honest, sometimes unwilling to ask for help or unwilling to ask for uh, information, um, that paradox has been something that has been uh, an area I've with in terms of uh, stepping into new roles or new positions, um, because it's not just that sometimes I may not have known to ask certain questions, um, but it also, I'm honest, needing that self-awareness to recognize my my hesitancy, my reluctance, my unwillingness to ask and embrace, hey, I need to get some information about this. I, I'm I'm well aware of what's expected of me, but how do I get to that point? And sometimes it's taking that position of saying, you know what, Tim, you don't know. So, you know, be able to reach out because many times the very people that we lead are not only just willing to help, but they have the information and they're subject matter experts. And if we are willing as leaders to kind of bridge that gap and say, you know what, hey, I, I know my role or I know what's expected of me as a, a leader or a teacher, but I also want to learn. I want to understand. And that can also help build that bridge for vision, as we were talking about earlier and some of the other paradoxes that we mentioned. Thank you. Yeah, the learner role can feel really vulnerable, especially you know, to the the typical expectation of leaders, you uh, the the confidence versus humility uh, paradox comes into play with teaching and learning as well. Thank you for sharing that. All right, yes. Mr. Cogburn, you may have already mentioned this. I'm moving on to question two. Which of the qualities from the paradoxes comes most naturally to you, and which have you had to work to develop, and how have you done that? Yes, I think I answered the first part. The one that most comes most naturally is the is the stubbornness and open mindedness. It's just I'm stubborn by nature. So if you're familiar with the disc disc profiles, disc types, I'm a high D. Um, so it's something that's just easy for me. Um, I don't mind challenging the process. It it drives me to be able to be stubborn and and you know the definition of leadership. And Ms. Carter shared this yesterday is getting people to do getting people to want to do what you need them to do. And sometimes being stubborn, that's it's an opportunity to do that. But the, the one area that I've had to develop and, and, and how have I done this, uh, it's not going to come as a surprise to the people that I work with. It's the deeply personal and inherently collective. Um, it's not that I don't care about people or I have a trouble balancing between mission first and people always, as, as, as Ms. Carter was talking about. But it's not my natural style. High D, if you know, again, about the disc profile, high D folks are, you know, task oriented. They want to move ahead. They are trying to just get the thing done. Um, but one of the areas that, I, that I've really tried to focus on is being more deeply personal, uh, as well as figuring out how that fits into the mission. And um, I'll, I'll share an example, you know, ha having um, I've been a part of a team uh over the years that have gone through different types of transitions, whether it's been transition of leadership or people moving in and out. And that becomes very difficult because you have to be able to navigate the what the mission is of either the VA or VBA or HCS or wherever you're following and your team. So what is that end goal? What is the mission? But also having to navigate how all this stuff has affected the people. Um, and you have to be able to do both. If you do, if it's used to one, the mission's going to fail. And if you do the other, then okay, the people are taken care of, or, or the people end up leaving. So you have to be able to do both. And it is very, very difficult to be able to do both, to be deeply personal, but also keep that inherently collective mindset, thinking about mission first. Um, and I think the best way to do it is be transparent. And I, that word cannot be overused. Having the ability to be transparent with anybody you're talking to, whether it's people that you're working with um, in your teams or in your leadership circle or wherever it is that you fall uh, as an informal or former leader in, in VBA, it's the ability to be transparent with folks. And that helps people feel like they're a part of something. And if they feel like they're a part of something, they feel like you care they will help you accomplish whatever that mission is. It's not to say it's going to be easy and people are going to 
have to get in calls and have some tough conversations, but it makes it easier to get to that mission if you are transparent about what that mission is, how it's going to impact the people, and what you're doing to help kind of mitigate all of that transition period. So I think that's incredibly important. Excellent. Thank you so much. Yeah, we're going to hear that that communication styles, transparency and communication, building trust um, as we get into our action planning, how to segment, um, how to develop your skills in these areas. Those uh, those things really do come into play in a lot of the, the paradoxes. Ms. Macklin, question two for you. Which of these qualities from the paradoxes comes most naturally to you and which have you had to work to develop and how have you done that? Yeah, so I think being deeply personal personal inherently collective um, comes naturally to me. I'm I'm a people person. So um, I want to know your story. I want to, you know, touch with, you know, not touch physically, but I want to, you know, find that commonality, that ground that where we can actually uh, relate. Um, so that's something that I always try to do. I ask to share, you have you share your stories, I'll share mine. Sometimes I overshare, uh, but it is something that um, I think it comes natural because I just want to know more about you and, 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 care about what you're doing outside and with work. Um, I think something that I struggle with, but, and I, I won't even say it's a struggle, it's more just something that I have to sit with that doesn't come naturally to me is the confidence and humility factor. Um, I think for myself, I am a, a person of feeling. So sometimes when a mission or something comes across my plate that I'm like, this is crazy, we've already done this, or you know, I have to sit with it for a little while because I know that I have to be able to sell this to my team, right? So I have to be able to gain that buy-in and how am I gonna come to the table and say, I know we already did this, I know we're exhausted, you know, um, and and not have at least a, some type of result, some type of resolve or encouragement to keep you know, pushing through for the mission. Um, so a lot of times I have to sit back and, and think about my wording and what I want to say and how I want to say it and also provide a safe space for my employees to be able to talk to me and vent if they need to or share their concerns and not be fearful of being able to do that because it is important to have that you know, platform to say yes, we are aware that this is something that you know we've already done. How are you feeling? How can we, you know, how can we create a solution to this? Are there workarounds? So, you know, tapping into that confidence factor and then also being humble about, you know, some of the feedback that I might receive. Uh, being able to recognize that, you know, I may not be believable in my pitch. Someone might say, you know what, Tanisha, we we totally read through that you weren't you weren't totally sold about this, and being able to adjust and adapt and and you know continue to advance my own uh, paradox in that and and recognizing that trait and just continue to move forward. And so I think confidence and humility are ones that I have to really sit with and just continue to grow. And it doesn't necessarily come naturally, but it is something I'm aware of. And, and I, I hope to continue to make it, get it to a point where I can just sell it like it's the best thing, the next best thing coming up the place. Thank you so much. The self-awareness piece is really big in all of this. And then that allows you to move into the self-management piece, which we'll get to in our uh, next activities. But let's wrap the, this up with uh, with uh, Mr. Stevenson. Question number three, why is it sometimes difficult to be able to balance your demonstration of any of these paradoxes? I would say the difficulty comes in maybe understanding how you delineate between the two. And what I mean is um, one of the areas, the paradoxes that I feel I've uh, have the most opportunity to grow in is the high standards and gracious forgiveness. And I think I lean far more towards the gracious forgiveness side uh, because I want to see people do well. I want to see people succeed. Um, but then when it comes time to move the bar, to move the standard, to have those hard conversations, I think that's a, an area where um, knowing how to balance the two and knowing how to uh, maybe carry both at the same time. Uh, so you want your employees, you want your area of influence to feel safe. You want them to feel uh, that, you know, you as their leader or you as their supervisor uh, can provide that safe environment for them to make mistakes, for them to learn, for them to develop. Uh, but you also don't want to set the bar so low that they're not challenged, that they don't grow. And if your area, uh, whether it's a team, a division, a station, whatever the case may be, um, 
when there's a time to improve the performance or areas where uh, there's some development that's needed, you have to have the fortitude to say, here's our standard, here's how we get there, or we need to move to the next level. So being able to kind of shift and, and navigate between both of those, I think is the difficulty. And particularly when you look at the other paradoxes, sometimes knowing, you know, at what point do I need to be humble? At what point do I need to be confident? And and there's not always a, a clear line for that. There's not always the same situation that you're going to face. So it's I think just recognizing when and how we operate in both of those um, traits uh, when we're talking about the conflicting um, paradoxes. Absolutely, yeah. Things can needs can change from person to person, from situation to situation on an hourly basis. It seems like sometimes. Thank you all so much for your insights and for those of you who chimed in in the chat with questions and comments. We appreciate that as well. Now it's time for all of you to assess your own abilities. Now, don't worry about going uh, to dig in for your uh, participant guide. If, if that's not convenient for you, you can do this on a piece of paper. Now that we've heard from all of our seasoned leaders, we're going to look inward and see how comfortable each of us are with demonstrating each of those paradoxical traits we've discussed. And like I said, you can use a piece of paper for this, draw some lines and put the traits on either end, just like the demonstration on the screen. Um, as an example, with the first paradox, confidence and humility, you would place an X on that line somewhere between the two traits to indicate your current self-assessed ability to balance them. For example, if you're much more comfortable demonstrating confidence than you are with humility, then your X would be to the far left below confidence or right. I may be looking at this backwards. It would be under confidence. If you're much more comfortable with humility than with confidence, your X would go to the side next to humility. Or if you believe that you're equally comfortable demonstrating both traits, put your X right in the middle between the two of them to indicate a comfortable balance. And then you would repeat that for each of the paradoxes. You feel free to add some comments in the chat if you want to discuss your own assessment where you think you might need to grow or where you might be strong. Um, and when you finish all eight, or if you'd rather wait and do that later in your participant guide, look at the traits that are farthest away from your X's. Those are the ones where you might want to consider developing an action plan to be able to increase your comfort level within that particular area. For me, I, I put my example up at the top. I am far better at being open minded than I am at being stubborn, and I take every opportunity to uh, watch and observe what Mr. Cogburn does so that I can improve my skills in that stubborn area. Um, so I put my ex uh, beneath open minded and my action plan will probably have some activities to help me build on that stubborn trait. Would anyone else like to share uh, where they think some of their challenge areas may be? In the chat. Ms. Crotto, as, as people are putting stuff in the chat, I think even doing a self-assessment is part of this whole process. Uh, identifying, knowing that you have to improve is part of identifying areas you have to improve. I remember the first time I got to do a full self-assessment. So for some of you might know, it's the 360 assessment. Um, and anybody can have these done. It's very eye-opening because you might think that you are very visible and other people around you might think that you're not. So it's important to have that awareness of what you think where you stand, but also I would even maybe go one step further, do this self-assessment, but then maybe talk to some people around you, talk to some of your peers. Well, where do you see me on this list? Because if they're conflicting, you might be closer to the middle than you think. So it's just something that keep in mind as you're going through this process. Absolutely. What you're intending to put forth may not be what's being perceived, and we're going to address that in our challenge at the end. All right, I see some comments coming in, some folks that want to work on the gracious forgiveness, especially towards yourself. I think that's very important. Being timely, someone has high standards but needs to realize that not everyone may be at the same place they are. Stubbornness, forgiveness, excellent. Well, now um, continue to put those in there and think about where your challenge areas are because now we're going to go into the how-to segment, segment and how, what you can do now that you've gained some self-awareness in your challenge areas, which you can continue to do, what can you do to develop those skills? That's where we work into the self-management side of these things. So panelists, again, feel free to chime in in the chat or come on uh, off mic if you want to add in here as we go through our how-tos. But let's start with how to display humble confidence. There we go. 
So to work on building both confidence and humility, one of my favorite suggestions is argue as if you believe you're right, but listen as if you believe you're wrong. This is the type of conflict that Patrick Lencioni, who wrote The Five Dysfunctions of a Team, describes as the passionate pursuit of truth. Remaining open to others' opinions demonstrates your humility, while knowing and trusting in what you do know shows your confidence. The last tip on this slide is one that we practice routinely in our weekly, weekly team meetings and learning and development. We save the last few minutes of every meeting for kudos. Uh, we brag about each other instead of having to brag about ourselves. Other people will always fill in the gaps and see contributions that you may not have even realized mattered to them. They can build your confidence for you while you demonstrate your humility in receiving that feedback. So it's a fantastic exercise. The tip that really stuck with me in navigating vision and blind spots is marry the problem, but date the methods you're using to solve it. There may be more options that you aren't even aware of, blind spots. Uh, so keep your focus on the desired outcome rather than the way that you've chosen to get there. You might be missing something. And that also plays into the stubbornness and open-mindedness a little bit, which we'll get to in a minute. There's some really great comments here. Becoming visible and invisible. Invisibility can be a challenge when leaders feel pressured to make sure their team is performing. Likewise, visibility can be a challenge for you if you're less comfortable feeling like you're in the spotlight. I know Mr. Cogburn mentioned some of the, the disc types and how those play into this. So if you're a D or an I, you're probably much more comfortable with visibility, whereas S's and C's may be more comfortable in the invisibility side. But to develop these, start by looking internally. We talked about self-awareness. Gain some awareness of your core values and or the organization's values. How can you model those? That's a great start to practicing visibility. Then how well do you know your team? Who on your team wants to step up, even if they may not say so? Who could benefit from a challenge like that while helping you to become more comfortable with invisibility? So let them help you with that. Accountability partners can also be really helpful with self-development activities. Never underestimate the power of sharing your goals and asking for feedback. Communication, like we said, plays a big part in developing your skills in some of these paradoxes, particularly stubbornness and open-mindedness. And feedback, again, comes into play here as a really valuable form of communication. Uh, we have an I like, I wish, I wonder board that you'll see if you attend any of our leadership programs at the Academy. And that was a concept brought to us by one of my teammates, Nafi Abdullah, and it has been a great tool for giving and collecting feedback. Both asking for and providing feedback can help you grow in both of these areas. Then something as simple as replacing yeah, but with yes, and can totally change people's perception of your intent and your open-mindedness. The former mentor that I mentioned earlier insisted that our customer service perspective always included yes, and in response to customer inquiries. We would always find a way to meet the need and also do what we needed to do. Um, that was really valuable advice that really shaped the way that I approach customer service. Reverse mentoring, peer mentoring, all those can be really beneficial here as well. And both of those lead to being both personal and collective. My favorite tips here are to seek to add value in every interaction and to pursue a new relationship or connection every week. When I first uh, joined VBA a little over a year ago now, within the first month, I reached out and scheduled one-on-one -on -one meetings with each one of my teammates. We were all new to L&D and I was new to the agency and I really needed to build my network and understand who I was working with. It was a mutually beneficial process because it allowed me to get deeply personal with my teammates and figure out how I could add value to the entire group by strengthening our working relationships and defining my role. So being a teacher and a learner, we're already taking that first step as learners today by working on our emotional intelligence building. By taking some of this information back to your teams and sharing what you've learned, you can work on the teaching side. Learn from one another in any group that you're in and make it known when someone else adds to your insight. You can add to their confidence and demonstrate your own humility that way too. I know some of you said that you wanted to work on this area and this paradox, uh, high standards and gracious forgiveness is really all about communication and consistency. 
Your words and your actions should work together to demonstrate your commitment to your high standards, as well as your position as a safety net for your team. Hold yourself to the same expectations, both the high standards and the forgiveness, and make that visible to your team. Ask questions so you can continue to learn, even from your mistakes. This also adds to the building trust and psychological safety within your team, whether you're leading formally or informally, or just focusing on your role as a team member. Elizabeth, are there any questions or comments that we need to catch up with in the chat? So we had some love for the I Like I Wish I Wonder board. Some people recall that and liked that concept. We had one participant mention that um, the confidence versus humility um, uh, paradox is one that they struggle with, particularly because they have uh, difficulty with imposter syndrome. And so oh. due to that, uh, they tend to um, stay in that humility side instead of finding a, more of a balance between humility and confidence. We want to do a whole session on imposter syndrome. That's a very frequent topic. So yes, definitely continue to work in that area and build the confidence. Let others help build it for you if that's easier too. Thank you. And last paradox. This is amazing, this, this acronym. I love this. How to be both timely and timeless. Create a thing of beauty. Just like Jimmy Buffett's Margaritaville Empire and his music, you can do the same thing by building your team through your great leadership. Make something better. Do something new. Put together processes and services that can adapt to the changing needs of your users or customers. Don't keep doing things the same way just because that's how it's always been. Make things relevant because they're constantly changing. And continue to develop processes for review so that you can always be ready to improve in any of your processes. All right, this is the challenge. Tim Elmore wrote in his book, it is only when great leaders prove themselves by living up to the challenges that we recognize the history they have made. We identified some areas that we'd all like to grow in. So now here comes your next challenge for once we leave here. And Mr. Cogburn already alluded to this. Over the next few weeks, I'd like you to share that self-assessment form from your workbook with a trusted colleague, a supervisor, a mentor. Ask them to assess your skill at balancing each of those paradoxes based on their perception of your performance. When you see that, compare their responses with your own self-assessment. Evaluate and discuss any of the variances and then use that data that you gather to continue to adapt your action planning for further growth toward becoming one of those leaders who will make history in a positive way. And now we're back. We have approximately six minutes for your questions and comments with our panel. Time for some interaction in the chat. And if you haven't already had a chance to do so, please feel free to add some questions here in the chat and we'll get to as many as we can and follow up later if we need to. And I will also open it up to our panelists to chime in with any additional things that they'd like to put out there to the group. So I, as questions are coming in, I'll highlight two things really quick. One is under that visibility and invisibility. On the slide we were just looking at, there was a quote, at the end of that quote said, bring out the greatness of others. Um, whether you are mentoring a new VSR coming in because you're a VSR and our VSR or you're in a leadership role and you're mentoring somebody. To me, I value success as the ability to have people get promoted or have people get those opportunities to help them grow and develop. That is such a huge thing and that goes across kind of a lot of these different um, different paradoxes here about building teams and building networks. Uh, the ability to take someone and, and kind of take them under your wing a little bit and mentor them or help them, whatever it may be, is incredibly important. Um, and then imposter syndrome, that is actually not something I've really ever dealt with, but I will be fully transparent that as, I, as I'm looking to move potentially uh, into a different role in the future as a part of my assistant director development program, uh, most of my leadership experience, actually all of it comes in central office. So I, don't, I was not an AVSC in the field, I was not a VSC in the field. Um, so as I'm looking at jobs to potentially go to the field as an assistant director, uh, I actually had a call yesterday with one of the executive sponsors, um, Charles Moore, who's the executive director of Nashville. Some of you may know him. He can be very transparent. And he had a conversation with me about that. He's like, look, end of the day, sell yourself. You're bringing things to the table that other people may not have. 
So don't focus on the things that you don't do or you can't do. Think about the things that you're really good at and highlight those things. So I, I thought that was that. incredibly important. I, I thought it was, is it, it, it was cool. It was so cool because in that moment, um, and then how, do, how did I know when I was ready for leadership? Um, I started seeing people around me that uh, were in that role and I wanted that challenge. I didn't feel like I was getting that challenge anymore, being an analyst in central office. And I, so I put in for a leadership program within the business line I was in to see if I would like that. And that just kind of blossomed from there. And if you have questions for me, you can reach out to me on the side after this because I know our time is limited. Excellent. I see one last question. Let's get to this one and then we will close it out because we all have to go to town hall. Um, communication isn't so great. I'm either 100% honest without regard to a response because honesty is best, good or bad, but I also am hesitant depending on a topic to communicate well out of fear of failing the person looking to have a specific discussion. How do you all find a balance? So I'll jump in real quick. So political savviness is a thing. It's a core competency. If you know anything about competencies, um, the ability to be politically savvy with answering a question. But if you don't have all be transparent, you're not failing the person by not being honest with them. You were being as transparent as you possibly can. And if you do that from day one, they will never question or most people will not question when you can't be honest with them about certain things. If you always are transparent and never, never waver in your transparency, if sometimes you have to tell them, like, look, I'm sharing everything I possibly can. And as soon as I can give you that answer, whatever that decision is, I will do that. A lot of times it's easier to have that conversation. If you are never transparent with them at all and you come to them and say, well, I can't really tell you. Well, you never tell me anything. You know, I, what, that's not helping me. So uh, that's what I would say. Thank you so much. Well, thank you I, to all would, of our panelists. Go ahead. Sorry, I would just piggyback. Um, if you don't know something and, and you have to be transparent in that, you know, the, the fail is if you don't follow up. So make sure that even if you don't have the answer right then and there, follow up with them and just make sure that if you have, once you get the answer, you're able to follow up with them. It's really vital um, to be able to, you know, sustain that reputation. And like Mr. Cogburn said, don't be afraid to say, I, I don't have that full scope at this point, but I will get back with you and follow up Own your words. And, you know, that is the best way to find that balance, because like he stated, they'll respect you and they'll they'll you'll continue to be an, an ally or someone that a trusted source to go to um, in that leadership. Excellent. Thank you so much. We are almost out of time. So let's uh, continue to move on here. And again, if you'd like to read the book that we talked about today, it is available on Skillsoft. And today we defined the eight paradoxes of great leadership. We did some self-assessments of your own strengths and challenge areas, and we identified some opportunities for growth and development in those areas with the help of our amazing panelists. And if you've got just a moment to take our evaluation, it'll also be emailed out to you. That'll help us to continue to bring you relevant and wonderful training uh, to get you to where you need to go with all of your personal and professional goals. Thank you all so much. And I will turn it back over to you, Elizabeth. All right, thank you so much to our panelists. Thank you, Tammy, for leading us through that content. We appreciate everyone's participation. And we have, I think, over 15 likes for a future course on imposter syndrome. So that will be something we'll have to research. <laughs> um, again, thank you all so much to our panelists. And uh, we appreciate your insights, very invaluable. And with that, we will be sending out the slides and the resources once again after this event. And then you can catch the recording on our SharePoint site. Um, by the end of the day tomorrow it will be posted. Again, the evaluation link will be in the email that I send later today. Thank you again and have a lovely day.